Okay, welcome back uh, everyone after that uh, short comfort break. Uh, again, for those of you who might uh, just have joined us uh, on Facebook Live, welcome. This is our session on courage. Uh, we've already had our Jesus journey component where uh, John Simons from uh, the Doxa Deo uh, family shared uh, from the life and teachings of Jesus with us. And uh, we just uh, had a case study interview with uh, the Paralympic gold medalist, uh, Avnu Furi. What an inspiring guy and uh, story from his life. So if you missed it, uh, hopefully you'll catch up uh, on the recording. Our last session uh, for this afternoon is really gonna bless you. Um, it is the first time we are privileged to welcome this esteemed gentleman um, all the way from Cape Town uh, to Life of Leadership. And uh, to do uh, him justly, I've asked uh, one of our alumnus, Gareth uh, Heimans, the CEO of Pop-Up, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Ruzani Maloiva to us. Gareth. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I think Ruzani is also a bit surprised that I'm going to introduce him. It's <laughs> called Trigger Ventures. And Ruzani was actually speaking at the conference, and I really loved the wisdom and the humility and also the insights and the fact that he's a thinker that he displayed there. So um, just to say one or two things about Rizzani, he's a medical doctor sp specializing in pediatrics. And there's a theme in his life. He, he seems to come from Limpopo to Cape Town to Limpopo to Cape Town. <laughs> but he's also been in KwaZulu-Natal where he actually studied and also in London. And one very interesting thing that I read about him is he won the Hamilton Naki Clinical Scholarship. It's called a prestigious scholarship that he won in 2012. And he was regarded at that time as one of the five African clinical research scientists with the greatest public or, um, contribution in terms of publications in South Africa for medical doctors. So. Rizani, we are really looking forward to hearing from you. Nice seeing you again. Thank, thank you very much, um, Harit. Um, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this meeting. I'm not sure if I can be seen or I'm in darkness. The light just changed now. Is it all right? Okay, thank you. Um, so as Harit uh, mentioned, I'm actually from Venda, but I'm now a Kryptonian. Uh, whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not so sure. Um, but uh, I'm here now and I'm, I work at Hruteskir and um, as well as Red Cross Children's Hospital where I'm an associate professor in pediatrics. So I, I'm not sure if I can share my screen. I've got just a very few slides that may be helpful, but um, I'm trying to compress three things that I think I thought were important when I was thinking about courage. And this is something that has been a theme of my life for the last couple of, of years now. And they are all interlinked. And usually I would probably talk about one or the other and not everything together. But I think it's probably important to, to be more broader, even if not too deep, in order to be able to kind of think about these themes in the context of, um, of your theme of courage. Um, and what I've called it is, um, is the courage to live um, in the light of truth. And, and I think that is quite key. And, and I'm allowed to read the Bible, right? <laughs> okay. So let me see if I can find um, an image here that I had put up. Um, if you can, oh no, it's, it's the wrong one. Um, I was trying to share, a, it will probably work for now. Let me just see if I can work with this. Um, this is coming from a theme that I would otherwise have called um, uh, building cathedrals uh, slide that, that would have been easier. Let me actually, maybe I should find it first. But let me tell you what, uh, what I'm trying to talk about here is this idea that has bothered me all for the last couple of years. And this is the idea of how we can 
build for a future that we will not see and have the courage to do so. And so what I tend to call this is, 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 building, is building cathedrals. And the reason why the theme of building cathedrals has been key to me, it's probably because I can't find a better, a better metaphor for this. It is this idea of what cathedrals in fact are like. Um, the idea, I don't know if you can, can you see my screen now? Harit, can you see my, can you skip, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, thank you. Can you see a, a, a photograph? Yes, it right. seems Perfect. like a cathedral. Yeah, this is a picture I took of St. Paul's in London. Um, and, I, and, and the reason why is if you go back and see how cathedrals were built um, and how long it, it took to build any and all of these cathedrals, they took tens of years, if not more than 100 years. In fact, the average, I think, a um, duration for a cathedral to be built is about 125 years. Now, you will have to wonder how one builds something that will take 100 years to build. How do you do that? How do you build such a cathedral? And, and, uh, and, and I want us to reflect on this when, I, when we read this, okay? This is a story about um, Hezekiah, who's regarded as one of the great kings of Judah, you know, and he comes out very positively in the biblical narratives. After he had been ill, uh, and he had been healed, and he'd been given more time, then envoys come from Babylon. And I'll read it quickly. At that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift, because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried, out, carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away and they'll become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Well, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? As for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all his achievements, and how he made the pool, and the tunnel by which he brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah rested with his ancestors, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. And if you read the, the historical narratives, the next chapter is it talks about Manasseh. It talks about him as being one of the most evil kings that Judah ever had. So evil that he even sacrificed his own son in the fire. That's how bad it was. But is that really surprising? given this attitude of Hezekiah that we've just read now, that all he was thinking about was actually just his time. As long as there's peace and security in my lifetime, everything is perfectly fine. And this is quite an important thing to realize because from the time of Manasseh, everything was downhill. There was a bit of a break put by, by Josiah, but you could say, you know, it was written, they were going to exile. This was the decline of Judah into Babylon because of the legacy of Manasseh, but the legacy of Manasseh is the legacy of Hezekiah. He did not care about the future in which his child and grandchild and so forth would live. And this is becoming key in our setting. Because to build a cathedral is the image that I've, I've mentioned earlier on. What do you need to do to do that? You need to have the courage to build foundations 
that are strong and deep. I always give an example. When I was in London, I used to go to All Souls Church um, in, uh, in Regent Street, um, Langham, Langham Place. And, and what was fascinating was that um, the church, that church was built, I think, in the late 1800s and by John Nash as the architect. And during the Second World War, it was bombed during the, um, uh, by you know, the German um, uh, bombers. And they only managed to fix part of that church, I think, in the late 70s. And when they were fixing the church, they were surprised to see that actually John Nash had sunk the foundation so deep, you could actually build a church hall using the walls of that foundation and as how deep they were. That is how you build cathedrals. You sit there and you say, goodness, these foundations are really amazing and I will never see the walls and I will definitely never see the roof. But the problem is we really lack the courage to actually build for a future we will not see. And Hezekiah is a classical example of that failure. Do we have the courage to build for a future we will not see? That is the first courage I want us to think about. So I'm talking about the future. And you can see an example here with David, you know, in uh, chapter seven um, of the second book of Samuel. I'm just gonna read the first uh, two or three verses. You know, the prophet Nathan came and tell uh, David about what God has promised. And David comes and says, who am I sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant and this decree sovereign lord is for a mere human and the funny and interesting part about that is that when you know if you know the story again the historical narratives of the old testament is that solomon did not have to 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 find the material for the temple because david had collected all of it david knew he couldn't build that temple but he made sure every material that was required was already collected and much more than that he inculcated in the one who was going to build the same vision that he had to actually build it. David knew will never see it. If you read the rest of it, he is just so thrilled because the reign of Solomon is tied up with the persistence of the promise of God to Israel through Solomon. But he had the courage to build to put everything together for a future he will never see. That's so that is the first part. And I think we need to worry about and think about it. That is building, do we have the courage to build to a future we will not see? The second part that I want us to think about is the present. And I always tell this story of a time when I went to attend a worldview, Christian worldview uh, uh, conference in Ontario, in Hamilton, in Canada. One of the speakers was reflecting on the time that he actually went to the south part of the States and he went to a slavery museum. And he said when he was there, he started reflecting and thinking, how did this happen? How did that generation even think it was all right to have slaves and to condone slaves. And some of those who owned slaves were actually Christians. How did they manage to do that? And then he said, but then it came a bit closer. How, for that matter, did Christians during the time of Hitler manage to condone the Holocaust? I mean, people don't realize that people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer were actually a minority in that space. Then he said, for that matter, how did Christians manage to condone apartheid? You know, Wombe was basically a minority within that space. And he said, when the truth came back to him, it hit him. They did not have the courage to see through the evil of their own culture. And the question that came back to him is, he says, what evil are we part of that we're perpetuating right now, that we're part of, but we do not have the courage to see through it? 
And so the second part I'm talking about that I want us to challenge us about is the courage to see. So the courage to build for a future we'll not see. The courage to see the present as it is. And this is key and critical for all of us. You know, it's just such an, a scary thing and to even and difficult to comprehend when government officials steal food from hungry children during COVID and think somehow it can be justified. When 500 billion is actually given for the for rescue plan and it all disappears overnight without having done the majority of what was intended to do. And these are people who are business people who, are, who think that it's actually okay. And how do you justify that? Well, you don't have to. You just don't have to see it. You just, and this is the problem. How can we build the courage to see, to see through the evil of our own culture and our time? Because it's only when we actually see that we can have a platform in which to build for that future that I've spoken about. And for me, that's again key and critical. And because it takes me to the last part, which is the past. Now, one of the characters that I really like um, um, from the kind of uh, Old Testament time towards the, 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 the end of the, the, the third millennium, which is before the coming of Christ, is um, uh, the grandfather of, um, of, Gamal, uh, of uh, Gamaliel that we know, Braban Gamaliel, Hillel. Now, Hillel, also called Hillel the, the Elder or Hillel the Great, is, was very instrumental in the writing of the Babylonian Talmud. As, and it's him who's credited with, after having been asked, how would you summarize the, all, the whole Old Testament? And he says the whole Old Testament can be summarized in one word, remember. When you look at the Old Testament, the whole history of Israel is a crisis of forgetting. Because remembering is not a passive action, it's an active process. And in order to, to, to remember properly, you need to learn to remember correctly, not to remember falsely. And, and this is critical and key. We come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. The story I've just read about David now uh, is recorded in the very same book that talks about what he did with Bathsheba. It's quite amazing that it's one of the few traditions that will not try to vanish the reality and the truth. They will say it as it is, because it's critical and important to remember well and to remember rightly, if you're gonna have a chance and a shot at the present and build foundations for the future. You know, um, about a couple of years ago, I was asked by um, um, someone from the Canadian think uh, tank to just have an interview with them. And, and, and it was quite an interesting thing. And we we're talking about um, uh, memory. And um, I was uh, reflecting on um, something that happened a couple, uh, some years ago. It was around the time I was being interviewed, um, where uh, I think it was uh, Benjamin Netanyahu who had actually gone to Germany and was talking about what happened with the Holocaust and was talking about how, uh, you know, it was not so much the Germans that actually led, uh, and, and, you know, led to the Holocaust. It was actually some imam who triggered this. And Merkel refused to accept that. It was an easy way out, an easy way that exonerates the Germans from the Holocaust. It's a great memory that one can embrace because it's an easy one, but it's not remembering right. And if those who don't have the courage to remember well and to remember rightly have got no hope to build a future that is lived in the light of truth, and therefore the ability and the courage to see through the evil of their own culture. And without doing that, there is no way or chance of not being a Hezekiah who is content with a narrow vision of peace in his lifetime that does not go beyond. You cannot build cathedrals with those who cannot leave the past 
the present and the future in truth. And for me, this is key and critical and it's becoming more and more important each and every day. Because with our involvement, be it in medicine, be it in business, be it in pastoring or running a church or a Christian organization, the question is, how can you build anything that glorifies God in that space without the courage to live in the truth? And that truth is past, present, and future with all different aspects that come together. They all are tied up with each other. And I think that's key and critical. I'm just going to finish with a slide that I found very important when I think about this. It's, um, this is the last paragraph of um, Alistair McIntyre's book, if you've read After Virtue. It's actually really beautiful when you reflect on this. He says, it is always dangerous to draw two precise parallels between one historical period and another. And among the most misleading of such parallels are those which have been drawn between our own age in Europe and North America and the epoch in which the Roman Empire declined into the Dark Ages. Nonetheless, certain parallels there are. A crucial turning point in that earlier history occurred when men and women of goodwill turned aside from the task of shoring up the Roman Imperium and ceased to identify the continuation of civility and moral community with the maintenance of that Imperium. What they set themselves to achieve instead, often not recognizing fully what they were doing, was the construction of new forms of community within which the moral life could be sustained so that both morality and civility might survive the coming ages of barbarism and darkness. If my account of our moral condition is correct, we ought also to conclude that for some time now, we too have reached that turning point. What matters at this stage is the construction of local forms of community within which civility and the intellectual and moral life can be sustained through the new dark ages which are already upon us. And if the tradition of the virtues was able to survive the horrors of the last dark ages, we are not entirely without grounds for hope. This time, however, the barbarians are not waiting beyond the frontiers. They've already been governing us for quite some time. And it's our lack of consciousness of this that constitutes part of our predicament. We are waiting not for a Godot, but for another doubtless very different St. Benedict. The reason why this is important is McIntyre says that we are already ruled, being ruled by the barbarians, but we cannot see it in terms of where we are right now. And I'm suggesting that this ties up with our future, if there is to be any future, with our, our past that informs what we see and what we're able to see. And that gives us the courage to be able to, to be in that space of living in truth, living in truth, in the light of the truth, past, present, and future. And so for me, as I said, I, I tried to kind of put too many things together. Any of this could be something, the future, something that I spoke, spent an hour talking about it and the past or the present. But I just want, you know, to to, to um, ask you to think about it, how we can learn and have the courage to remember well, remember correctly, to have the courage to see through the evil of our own time and culture and to have the courage to build for a future we will not see. And a lot of you are in this privileged position that you can make the choices to do so. And so even as I pray, Lord, give everyone here, all of us, you who has made all things beautiful and created in man the yearning for an eternity, even though we don't know what you're doing from beginning to end, give us the courage to remember well, remember correctly, Give us the courage to see, even through the evil of our own culture. And dear Lord, we pray that you give us the courage to build for a future, even the one that we will not see, so that in all things your great name may be glorified. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ruzzani. You gave us uh, a few things, several things to uh, think about. And uh, I just love that metaphor. Um, my wife um, is from Germany and uh, she hates traveling anywhere in Europe with me because it doesn't matter if it's a small or a large city, I end up going into all the cathedrals and I just stand there in awe, um, looking, you know, those stained glass windows. And, you know, it's not uh, that I'm a Catholic uh, myself, but uh, just to, to experience the, the legacy component uh, of that. So um, thank you for, for talking about the courage uh, to, to not only look at the past and the present, but to also build a future which we won't see. Uh, you know, and at the business schools of the day, it's quite often about climbing the so-called ladder of success and instant results, uh, which we're striving for. So uh, thank you so much for that. And if uh, everyone can join me in giving Dr. Ruzzani a huge shout out and a virtual applause. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, thank you. And uh, it takes courage as a health worker as well. Uh, you know, uh, in your job also at Grote Skier Hospital, uh, we're praying for you and thank you for what you and all the health workers around the globe are currently doing uh, in these uh, difficult times. Thank you.